It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Hi, I'm Dale Latour, and this is Eco Ecclesia, the Church in a Climate Crisis. It took me way too long to stop planning and start producing. The more I learned, the more I felt I needed to learn to cover it all. But then I realized it's like the church in general. We don't wait until we have it all together. There's no guaranteed plan that we need to construct before we can begin. For one, there's not time to waste. So here we go. Eco Ecclesia, being church in a climate crisis. I'll say some things about how I came up with that name and what I hope it will communicate a little later when I talk about the theological reformation we need to instigate around creation and sustainability. I'm venturing out to do this series of what I hope will be a weekly or regular sequence in service to an exploration of what I have come to consider a significant and even foundational focus of theology. As such, the Church has a mission to be in and with the world to work together on this and a calling to equip ourselves and mutually support one another, which is an important new pastoral care task as we enter into this unprecedented time. To bring home the message that, as Brian McLaren says in a book title of his, everything must change. Uh, it now seems to me that each of us has some set of resources that we bring. Some people really grasp how science works in the scientific data. Some people have a deep grounding in their religious tradition. I'll talk later about some of the other uh, three categories that are helpful to people. Um, some people have financial means. Some people have a large platform. Uh, and some people have a sincerity that they can influence the people around them. I now want to say that it's not enough to sit firmly ensconced in your particular area of strength and to add on a little climate message like an extra little module you add on top. Well, I agree. Now that we need to rethink global community, rethink our religion and rethink our science from the standpoint of an earth in peril. In his chapter of the book, For Our Common Home, Process Relational Responses to Laudato Si, Clayton writes in reference to Pope Francis, the encyclical is groundbreaking because of the urgency of its call to action here and now. No small fixes, no fortunate breakthroughs in technology will get us out of this mess. After all, it was techno-absolutism that got us here in the first place. Nothing less than an ecological conversion will suffice. Page 446 of For Our Common Home. And I think I'd like to point a finger at those of us who've been environmentalists for the last 20, 30 years. Um, a recent article about the time of the great climate march in New York City in September, which drew 400,000 marchers yeah. and the participation of 1,500 organizations for the largest march ever in the history of the planet. A critique published just before the march said that we need to be aware, aware of the danger of what he called climate change liberals yes and the climate change liberals have the idea that we don't want to rock the system we want to make gentle urging to our businesses and our leaders and then he warned that there was a certain impotence to the gentle reminder it seems to me that we in the environmental movement are guilty of offering little changes we were afraid to name the future Unlike what this series is doing, we just said, we don't want to demoralize the people we talk mm. to. So let's just say, if you recycle your plastic bags, you know, if you drive a little bit less, if you ride a bike once a week, it's all going to be fine. Because we, we felt if we told them what the science was really saying, they would give up. Right. And I think what your future, what your future series here is saying is, let's name it. Let's say exactly what the truth is, and let's say it now. If people um, are inclined to give up, at some point, as the, the, the crashing wave, the tsunami of this 
of this global climate disruption becomes visible, it won't seem too radical. Right. I, I think what your, your series is calling each of the 50 speakers to do is to absolutely name the future as clearly and distinctively as we can do it. And then to find those elements of hope, those moments of hope in the reality of the situation. It's part of what I call the threefold radical response. It, that threefold radical response leaves behind those days of the compatibility of science and religion, the climate change li liberals, and the gentle nudge. And it says, as uh, uh, Brian McLaren, another participant in this series, says, everything must change. Yes. Everything must change. So the, the threefold response includes, uh, these are topics we've talked about before, but not all your listeners will be familiar with them. The role of the evolutionaries and the process thinkers. Mm -hmm. These are people who say you no longer can understand reality as a sort of static given, but it's a continual process of unfolding and developing. Yep. That we need to see ourselves, each generation, as facing a new world, in our case, a new Earth, two A's. Mm -hmm. And that we need to recognize that our entire response, philosophy, religion, science, society, needs to respond to the emerging reality that we deal with. Mm -hmm. And our reality and the reality for generations to come is a hostile planet whose ecosystems we have profoundly disturbed. Amen. Ecological conversion. That's the thought here. It is, as I see it, nothing less than a reformation that's required here. What constitutes the theological elements of that is radically open to the continuing movement I'm seeing happening now. I met Philip Clayton about three months after seeing the interview from which I borrowed these previous clips, which was part of a series of over 50 interviews by Michael Dowd with theologians, philosophers, cosmologists, scientists, artists, and activists. This broad expanse of disciplines is what future theology and future church are going to have to invite in to inform and inspire and speak to us of the urgency of the task of ahead of us, a church in climate crisis. This interview series, entitled The Future is Calling Us to Greatness, blew me away with its multifaceted, cross-discipline, cross-training that we must all let blossom in our churches, in our preaching, teaching, and mission. All of these are duties of the church. Everything must change. I will also include a link to the website where you can purchase this entire ser interview series for only $25. 50 plus amazing conversations between Michael Dow and this collection of people from across the spectrum of what I am calling the climate crisis disciplines. I found, though, that it ended up costing me a lot more than $25, since after listening to them, I was compelled to buy a lot of the books by these people. You can find a link to the series in the description for this video below. And books will also become a regular segment in this series. There are an awful lot of them that deserve to be study group material in churches as they enrich and expand our sense of the theological task that we face. But beyond the task they represent, we in the church must take on the challenges as good news, as signs of the continuous activity of the kingdom of God. I have no qualms with framing it this way, as foundational to our thinking about what the kingdom of God impinging upon us means for us as people of God in the Anthropocene. So what would an ecological conversion look like in the church? How would it change the everyday workings of congregations sensing, seeking, and participating in the needed reformation? This is what I hope to explore with this new webcast series, Eco Ecclesia, The Church in a Climate Crisis. My journey to this place, to where I'm now focused, which is devoting my energies to the help the church and the world in this crisis, began as something I now see as having been embedded in my mountaintop experience, that experience to which I often point as the place where my Christian journey began in earnest. My own conversion story memory was walking a path in the hills of a Vermont retreat center in 1973 at the age of 17. The sense of belonging that I then focused on the youth group may have been finally enabled in that context of being alone in nature. And so that helped foster that sense of connectedness. 
My exposure to the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C. three years later situated the church in the heart of the struggles of people and the longings we all have for community and deep relatedness and mutual accountability. The biographer or historian of the Church of the Savior, Elizabeth O'Connor, titled one of these biographies, Journey Inward, Journey Outward, stressing how we need the resources of community to give us the strength to endure the work of redemption and reconciliation. I'll come back to this key point just a little later on in this story. This prepared me to receive the prophetic insights of Martin Luther King Jr. two years later during my senior year in college, when I heard a more complete story of Dr. King and was to return to MLK several times over the years to recall how he had seen, in the course of his life, the same integral realities that were to shape his theological senses. And so I've continued to pay tribute to his life and work as mentor to my journey. From Al Gore's Earth in the Balance, my earliest memory of the awareness, to This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein's treatment of how capitalism versus the climate names the root problem, which is how humanity's chosen story has led to our deceiving ourselves into an immensely dangerous situation. This is eschatological to the core for me, and ultimately for all of us. It reaches into the core purpose for biblical eschatology, which is the prophetic seeing of what is happening and where that could take us, and has already begun to do so. Matthew Fox began to unpack it for me, this theological sense that our very lives were dependent on the ecosystem and the universe in which we find ourselves, that God was in and amongst us and through everything, to begin to knock down this Greek Western two-tiered hierarchical Gnostic notion of the universe as a dualism and see an integral process of life that reaches back further than we ever imagined and that we have brought the advance of the human species much further toward a limit than we ever allowed ourselves to admit. So thrilled we've been with our advancements and growth. I've had people ask me incredulously, you mean there's something wrong with growing? What's wrong with growth? Don't we want economic growth? Obviously missing the point that growth, in the qualitative sense, must take into account the limits, which are ethical, mathematical, scientific. It all points to what MLK had frequently expressed, this awareness that all life is interrelated, that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality so that all suffer when one suffers. It's the way of life, the way of ecosystems, and all creation is an ecosystem. God is the one through whom all things hold together. So I entered seminary at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and fortunately, just prior to an unfortunate shift toward the Christian right and right-wing corporate allied politics, politics that adopted a theological narrative which was compatible with what I was soon over the next 35 years to see as a skewed story against which the Church of the Savior and Martin Luther King Jr. had fought. Reading biographies of MLK and the Civil Rights Movement along with Clarence Jordan's story led me naturally into some interaction and dialogue in books and in recordings with Tony Campolo who provided me with a lot of sociological analysis with theological focus, which further prepared me with the analytical eyes to recognize the way that stories or narratives work, which is just under the surface of consciousness. They, they're experienced as assumptions or obvious or the way things are. My discovery of Matthew Fox through a, an enticing title in a bookstore, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, lured me into a level of cosmological thinking within theology that further prepared the road for me in years ahead. Campolo and Fox were writing during a time when the first dire warnings were coming out of the climate science community, James Hansen being one of the first. My first exposure to climate science was through Al Gore's 1992 book, Earth and the Balance, Ecology of the Human Spirit. The issues we face regarding our life on this planet and within this cosmos are things which tend to get buried deep in our psyche and can require some heavy theological, philosophical, and socio-psychological excavation to uncover. I got a little closer to my final excavation or uncovering or 
dramatic realization of the truths of climate change, when I began to see and understand the alignment of the powers that be around this notion of growth in our economic system. First, I became aware of the extent of the shift of the benefits of our growth and production in our economy from the people to the elites, or the 1%. And so I began following and reflecting on the Occupy movement and wrote a lot on this through my blog at OccupyTheology.org. This was to become a major focus of mine in 2011 through 2014 as economic upheavals around the world, starting with the Arab Spring, was to result in a powerful movement in the U.S. following the deep economic slump precipitated by the banking crisis in the U.S. And then to see how a part of this shift of the benefits of progress to the top is accompanied by the shifting of the byproducts or the consequences of that growth to sacrifice zones, a term that I first heard Chris Hedges use. One such sacrifice zone is the externalizing of cost, meaning the byproducts of our technological activity is not represented as a cost of doing business, but in actuality, others are made to bear those consequences in far away or far removed places, often often in proximity to the homes of the poor and minorities and indigenous but people, but people lacking power or economic power. Our present climate crisis, which has been going on for some 300 years, in no small measure because of the Industrial Revolution, that revolution where fossil fuel-driven energy sources begin to drive an extraction of those treasures that had been buried under the surface of the earth by millions of years of geologic and ecological process. That process had begun by ancestors in our lineage of technological pioneers with the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, which produced a nature-defeating or nature-mastering process that enabled us to separate ourselves from the natural limits. Although most of humanity was, as of yet, through most of this history, unaware, until the last 40 years or so, of the extent to which this miracle of progress was discovered to be a dangerous precedent. The byproducts, the emissions, have been discovered to be dangerously altering the balances of nature. It goes even further back and into the 50s, according to an old Frank Capra movie clip I found only yesterday. The first significant wave of such information to reach me was flooding into the media with the warnings of climate scientist James Hansen in the late 80s, and journalist Bill McKibben made it his vocation to follow the science and write for us what it might all mean in the years to come. All of this activity was something that was brought home to me by a long process of reading about economic injustices done in the name of expansion and growth by our national and global economics. I began to read of these matters of science and earth when Al Gore released his book as he was running as Bill Clinton's VP in the 1992 election, his book Earth in the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit. By then, I'd begun reading Matthew Fox, and a favorite author and speaker, Tony Campolo, wrote a book on the subject. I read some of the headlines on the subject over the years and acknowledged their importance as a matter of ideology and politics, but never really internalized them. But this began to happen with me very quickly during my reading of Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything. I had read her book from seven years earlier, in 2007, The Shock Doctrine, which was about how economic interest would seize upon emergencies to push through more radical measures under the guise of necessary medicine for unprecedented times. Prior to this, I can remember often feeling like I did not want to read the things about our ecological predicament that confessed up front that things did not look good. I remember Bill McKibben's article in Rolling Stone, the terrifying new math, that Bill McKibben explained was indeed something any sane person who understands this and believes scientists would be scared of. McKibben wrote, At this point, effective action would require actually keeping most of the carbon the fossil fuel industry wants to burn safely in the soil, and not just changing slightly the speed at which it's burned. Then Naomi Klein, in This Changes Everything, really named that form of denial in which I had been engaging. She wrote, I denied climate change for longer than I cared to admit. 
I knew it was happening, sure. Not like Donald Trump and the Tea Partiers going on about how the ex continued existence of winter proves it's all a hoax. But I stayed pretty hazy on the details and only skimmed most of the news stories, especially the really scary ones. I told myself the science was all too complicated and that the environmentalists were dealing with it. And I continued to behave as if there was nothing wrong with a shiny card in my wallet attesting to my elite frequent flyer status. A great many of us engage in this kind of climate change denial. We look for a split second and then we look away. Or we look but then turn it into a joke. More signs of the apocalypse, which is another way of looking away. We don't have to do anything to bring about the future that we fear. All we have to do is nothing. Just continue to do what we're doing now. Whether it's counting on a techno fix or tending to our gardens or telling ourselves we're unfortunately too busy to deal with it. All we have to do is not react as if this is a full-blown crisis. All we have to do is keep on denying how frightened we actually are. And then bit by bit, we will have arrived at the place we most fear. The thing from which we have been averting our eyes. No additional effort required. After reading This Changes Everything, I went back to review some of the things Brian McLaren had been writing over the years. Interestingly enough, the book which he had spent the most time on the gravity of the problem of the climate crisis is titled Everything Must Change, Naomi Klein's title, This Changes Everything. Here's some of the things that McLaren articulated in his book, Everything Must Change, during the conversation he had with Michael Dowd. As a preacher, it didn't matter what you said. At the end of the day, people were going to act in their self-interest. Right. And so what we need is a story that raises people's sense of self-interest. Yes. Uh, you know, it, back in the uh, early days of capitalism, they talked about enlightened self-interest, but it, it wasn't enlightened enough. We, we've got to get more enlightened yeah. than the enlightenment. Uh, because we have to understand now that self-interest means... Uh, the well-being of the planet, you know, yes, that exactly. that uh, I, I cannot eat if the bees are not doing well. Yes. And the bees are not doing well, uh, you know, if there's any number of other issues. So self-interest suddenly expands to the common goods. If a person isn't tempted to despair, uh, they they don't know the gravity of the problem. So the first thing I'd say is if you're tempted to despair, that's fantastic. That, that says you, you're facing the gravity of the problem. And the second thing I'd say is that if you succumb to despair, then you have now become part of the problem. And uh, so if you, the gravity of the problem bothers you, you have no choice but to, in a certain sense, have faith. Um, to, you know, I, I like what my friend Jim Wallace says. He says, faith is believing something, it, this relates to our discussion, against the evidence and watching the evidence change. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what that says is that when I take all the evidence into account, and then I'm willing to act in a way that's constructive and creative and, and productive and hopeful and morally guided, you know, I, I dare to believe that my actions and the actions of others can create a different scenario. Because despair is very much buying into the idea that we are not protagonists in our own story. Just before watching most of the interviews in the series The Future is Calling Us to Greatness, I had paid a visit to the Vanderbilt Divinity School Library to look for some of the books I had found referenced in McLaren's bibliography for Everything Must Change. One was Larry Rasmussen's Earth Honoring Faith, which I think merits a spot as every seminary's textbook for foundational ecotheology. The series Michael Dow did was an eye-opener into the expanse of what I might call eco-theological subtopics that opened into a much larger discipline in and of itself than I had dreamed. Another highlight from Michael Dowd's interview series was hearing from Ted Christopher, whom I then found at the conference in Claremont, California in June 2015, called Seizing an Alternative Toward an Ecological Civilization, where he said something that has stuck with me in the months since. But one of, one of the things that I've seen so far in this path of, of trying to figure out how religious communities and religious leaders can most effectively step into this role that we desperately need them in uh, in relation to the climate crisis um, 
is that, that it can't just be abstract, that um, we can't serve that function of making meaning for people in their crisis. Um, we can't serve it just behind the doors of, of, of the church, that um, we, we can't be making meaning outside of that crisis, that um, in this period of, of upheaval, um, the, the old sources of our authority, uh, of our institutions and our traditions, um, they're all sort of in question because we're no longer living in that period. You know, all of our, all of our religious communities and our religious traditions, um, even the younger religious traditions and the ones that are in flux, like Unitarian Universalism and things like that, um, all of those are products of the Holocene. They are all products of, of a completely different world. Um, and we are now living in the Anthropocene. We are living in, in a different and unprecedented age. And if we're gonna have authority to be making meaning in this unprecedented age, the only authority that we can have has to be from in the crisis, has to be from in this age, that our, our authority for making meaning um, has to come from our willingness to stand at the center of the crisis. So this fits the inward journey part of this task of which I spoke earlier in relation to Church of the Savior. This is central to the strength of the community we need to help us get through. And as Tim De Christopher says earlier in that discussion, help maintain our humanity in this time of upheaval. There are several books I found myself reading as a result of watching this series. I'll provide a link in the description of this video on YouTube to the Amazon information on these books. And if you decide to buy any of these, I hope you'll use the links I provided so I can get a little kickback from Amazon. It won't affect your Amazon price, but, and it'll help me in a little in the process of producing this show. Paul Hawken, Blessed Unrest. Paul Gilding, The Great Disruption. Philip Clayton, Organic Marxism. Michael Dowd, for, Thank God for Evolution. William Catton, Overshoot. James Hansen, Storms of My Grandchildren. Bill McKibben, Deep Economy. Earth with two A's, Honey and Oil. David Corden, Change the Story, Change the Future. Drew Dellinger, Love Letter to the Milky Way. Others from recommendations and from my own browsing and research. Elizabeth Johnson's Ask the Beasts, Darwin and the God of Love. Leah Shade, Creation Crisis Preaching, Ecology, Theology, and the Pulpit. And in my conversations with Leah, she recommended Margaret Swedish, Living Beyond the End of the World, A Spirituality of Hope. There are others, but I'll save them for a future episode. As much as I have been finding to read on a pretty much constant basis, there will be plenty of them, but I don't want to weigh this episode down too heavily. This episode has been primarily an account of my ecological conversion for my theology. Future episodes will include interviews with various authors, activists, church leaders who are eco-leaders, pastors, and lay people alike. I'll also do some regular segments on what people are doing in their churches and out in the world to help move us toward an ecological civilization, which is the challenge posed by the Seizing Alternative Conference in Claremont, California in June 2015. I'll close this episode with some highlights from the three Skype conversations I've done, which will be featured, each one, over the next three episodes, along with other segments. I'm hoping to see some of the regular or semi-regular segments evolve and expand into their own show and build Eco Ecclesia into a network of webcasts dedicated to helping the church be a people on a journey toward an ecological civilization. So see what's coming up next over the next three weeks. Norman Wiersba of Duke will be the feature interview in episode four, Tyler Sitt in episode three, and Leah Shade in episode two, which I'm intending to release February 21st, this Sunday. I'm hoping to get better at my workflow as I get into the habit of producing these shows. I've got a lot of learning yet to do with some of my tools here, and more to envision and discover about what Eco Ecclesia can be. Enjoy the samples from the upcoming conversations, 
and I'll see you next week. When we only engage reality or primarily engage reality in terms of what it'll do for us, uh, then the integrity of other creatures is denied. It'd be like me being in a relationship with you, but only being in it insofar as I can get you, Dale, to do what I want or get you to satisfy my desire or allay my fears or whatever that happens to be. And so the integrity of who you are is denied. And, uh, you know, as my colleague Ellen Davis has shown in her book, Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, when we bring an agrarian lens to our reading of Scripture, uh, things open up for us in some pretty profoundly new ways that are, are very illuminating and can help us see that theology isn't simply about some God far removed from this world, but is instead about God at work in this world in the very basic things like how we have food, how we can share a life together, how we can share death together. Um, the faith of Christians isn't about uh, sort of spiritual realities simply, but it's also about embodied realities. And I'm just trying to figure out what that looks like when you work it out. From seeing that and, and um, living into that narrative as a family, uh, these values of justice and inclusion and fairness were deeply ground into me. And so I grew up with, uh, with this love of nature, with this uh, passion for fairness and justice. And I didn't see that they really had to do anything with each other until really until I got to college and, and later to seminary. Um, when I realized that because of the way that our society is structured, some people have access to nature and some people don't. And some people have access to clean air and some people don't or fresh food or clean water or access to green collar jobs or whatever. And I realized that um, the earth and environmentalism and the sacred connection that I felt is also a deeply racialized issue and an economic issue as well. And so when the Minnesota Annual Conference of the Methodist Church um, uh, suggested that I plant a ministry, they, they invited me to really consider what is the, the deep hunger of my heart and I realized that um, there needs to be a church plant that focuses on environmental justice. And so I just felt like there was a lot of spirit moving in this place. But at the same time, because there are people of color here and because um, there's, a, there's quite a bit of poverty in these neighborhoods, there's also a lot of pollution. And so um, there is a lot of factories polluting the air and um, access to fresh food is something that's always a struggle. So that, those are kind of some of the dynamics that I felt like were ripe for New City Church. Uh, when we are doing things to the environment that really uh, kill the, the, the ability of Earth to sustain life, then we are, in fact, uh, creating a cruciform spirit. The, 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 the very spirit of life um, is, is being uh, killed again, over and over again. So that's why I use the term uh, eco-crucifixion, um, also noting that there is another side here, which a lot of times uh, eco-theologians don't develop, is that there must also be an eco-resurrection, that um, while we are heading towards what I believe is the, the Good Friday of our planet, uh, that we need to continue this work because we don't want to say, well, it's going to happen who, you know, there's nothing we can do and just resign ourselves to, to apathy or to numbness or to, to just um, giving up. Uh, that we are, we are called to continue to do this work knowing and, and in faith, knowing that God is also working in ways that we can't even see. Which, when you think about the, the pyramid, the hierarchy in which the, 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 the patriarchal worldview is constructed, where you have God here at the top, and then um, privileged men at the, this next tier. And then you have uh, privileged women, but of course are subordinate to them. And then you have uh, people of color. Um, and then even within that, you have like a little triangle of men on top and then women and then children. But then down here, you've got the whole rest of the, of the natural world. So the ones that are closest to the natural world, by this logic, can be dominated, can be brought into subservience by the ones on top, including God. 
it's you know this this way of thinking authorizes those right under that believe themselves to be right underneath uh, the divine to control and manipulate and use all of this for their purposes. So we have to rethink our paradigm. We have to rethink the um, the way we imagine the relationship between humanity and God uh, to be more like a web where everything is all interconnected. All of the strands are interconnected. Human beings, while capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves. Pope Francis, in my back to receive.